Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 9, Text Number 4. O King, the Personality of Godhead, being very much pleased with Lord Brahma because of his non-deceptive penance in Bhakti Yoga, presented his eternal and transcendental form before Brahma, and that is the objective goal for purifying the conditioned soul. Report by Srila Prabhupada. Atmatattva is the science of both God and the living entity. Both the Supreme Lord and the living entity are known as Atma. The Supreme Lord is called Paramatma, and the living entity is called the Atma, the Brahma, or the Jiva. Both the Paramatma and the Jivatma, being transcendental to the material energy, are called Atma. So Shukadeva Goswami explains this verse with the aim of purifying the truth of both the Paramatma and the Jivatma. Generally, people have many wrong conceptions about both of them. The wrong conception of the Jivatma is to identify the material body with the pure soul, and the wrong conception of Paramatma is to think him on an equal level with the living entity. But both misconceptions can be removed by one stroke of Bhakti Yoga, just as in the sunlight, both the sun and the world and everything within the sunlight are properly seen. In the darkness, one cannot see the sun, nor himself, nor the world. But in the sunlight, one can see the sun, himself, and the world around him. Srila Shukadev Goswami therefore says that for purification of both wrong conceptions, the Lord presented his eternal form before Brahmaji, being fully satisfied by Brahma's non-deceptive vow of discharging bhakti yoga. Except for bhakti yoga, any method for realization of atma tattva or the science of atma will prove deceptive in the long run. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that only by bhakti yoga can one know him perfectly, and then one can enter into the science of God. Brahmaji undertook great penance in performing bhakti yoga, and thus he was able to see the transcendental form of the Lord. His transcendental form is 100% spiritual, and one can see him only by spiritualized vision after proper discharge, uh, discharge of tapasya or penance in pure bhakti yoga. The form of the Lord manifested before Brahma is not one of the forms with which we have experience in the material world. Brahmaji did not perform such severe types of penance just to see a form of material production. Therefore, the question by Maharaj Parikshit about the form of the Lord is answered. The form of the Lord is Satchit Ananda, or eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. But the material form of the living being is neither eternal, nor full of knowledge, nor blissful. That is the distinction between the form of the Lord and that of the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul, however, can regain his form of eternal knowledge and bliss simply by seeing the Lord by means of bhakti yoga. The summary is that due to ignorance, the conditioned soul is encaged in the temporary varieties of material forms. But the Supreme Lord has no such temporary form like the conditioned souls. He is always possessed of an eternal form of knowledge and bliss, and that is the difference between the Lord and the living entity. One can understand this difference by the process of bhakti yoga. Brahma was then told by the Lord the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam in four original verses. Thus, Srimad Bhagavatam is not a creation of the mental speculators. The sound of Srimad Bhagavatam is transcendental, and the resonance of Srimad Bhagavatam is as good as that of the Vedas. Thus, the topic of the Srimad Bhagavatam is the science of both the Lord and the living entity. Regular reading or hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam is also performance of bhakti yoga and one can attain the highest perfection simply by the association of Srimad Bhagavatam. Both Shukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit attained perfection through the medium of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, Srila Prabhupada points out here uh, two uh, misconceptions concerning Paramatma and the Jivatma, and I recently had occasion to see a rather thoroughgoing exhibition of both misconceptions. Uh, 
So the first misconception is to identify the jivatma with the material body. Uh, so what can I say about that? Uh, and the second misconception, curiously enough, is to identify the paramatma with the jivatma. So indeed, we, we saw both at this conference, which was just held in San Francisco during the last few days. Uh, of course, the standard theme of what everyone said, practically speaking, was that the uh, conscious self is to be identified with the material body, uh, specifically with some aspect of the functioning of the brain. Uh, this was harped on endlessly. Uh, so, but occasionally a glimmer of transcendental light would break through the cloud, the roiling clouds of uh, mind-body identification, and we would briefly see mentioned the idea that actually the conscious self is equivalent to the universal self, and in fact that there is only one mind. So either the mind was identified with the uh, brain, or we were told that there was one mind, one or the other. So it does seem that these mistakes were being made. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada points out here that you really require bhakti yoga in order to properly understand uh, the nature of the conscious self and also the uh, supreme conscious self uh, in relation with uh, matter. So this is presented in the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, in great detail, going back to Shukadeva Goswami and uh, Vyasadeva. So uh, the problem is how to relate that to the people of modern scientific mentality who have no faith in old scriptures and who are placing their uh, faith in uh, partially in empirical studies and partially in wild speculation. Uh, as far as I could see at this conference, there's not that much interest in empirical study. Mostly what we saw was <laughs> uh, completely untrammeled speculation just going on and on. <laughs> so uh, I won't give you a blow-by-blow -blow account, but if you like, I can recommend to you the uh, series of tapes of these lectures. It will provide you with two solid days of listening pleasure, and you can dive deeply into the, the ocean of these highly scientific deliberations and see what you think. So uh, in any case, uh, there was one, uh, I gave one presentation there, but I was thinking of another one that would be interesting to give also. Uh, so I'll just present that here for the moment, uh, just for the fun of it. Uh, and this uh, is based on the, not so much even on the uh, consciousness on, confer on uh, conference on consciousness that I just went to, but on another conference that Drew de Karma and I went to uh, a few days before that in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that was the Artificial Life Conference. So in that conference, everyone was concerned with showing that life is just a material system, and in fact, you could uh, build life forms yourself using computer technology. Those people were very fond of computers. At this conference, we didn't have any real uh, aficionados of the uh, computer realm, although uh, we met this guy, Osborne, uh, of the Osborne Computer Company, and uh, He's a very interesting fellow. Uh, he's uh, a totally self-confident, entrepreneurial type of person. So he came up, and in a deep, booming voice, he said, in 10 years, it will be all be over, because at that time, I will have a uh, super-intelligent computer that can do anything a human being can do. And he just declared this. <laughs> and he had perfect confidence. I asked him how he knew, and, well, he just knows. But anyway, 
At this artificial life conference, practically everyone was like that. Except they were only saying a uh, 100 years, whereas this guy said 10 years. So there's this idea that uh, you can uh, build some kind of material structure which undergoes some sequence of transformations based on the laws of physics, and that will be conscious. So people have this idea. And some people even think that uh, you could build a computer and the computer will be conscious. Others think that only brains can do it for some reason. They think that somehow you need uh, cytoplasm and mitochondria and things like that in order to have consciousness. Even though um, uh, amoebas and paramecians also have cytoplasm and mitochondria. Uh, so in any case, uh, what I uh, had come up with was a little uh, story to illustrate the idea that you're not your body within the concept, within the uh, domain of uh, computer science ideas. So here's how this goes. This is a thought experiment. But unlike some thought experiments, this is one you could actually perform. You could do it today if you had a, a few million dollars. So, uh, in fact, I'm going to recommend some of these people to do this, not that they probably will. But the, the first ingredient in this uh, story is that you need a telerobot system. I've mentioned this before a couple of times, but it's a very, fairly simple kind of apparatus that you could build what you have is on the one hand a kind of special helmet that fits over a person's head uh, so that his eyes are looking into t TV screens that fit over each eye and there are uh, um, you know headphones uh, piping sound into his ears and so forth and then he also is wearing a kind of harness so that uh, with sensors that pick up uh, tension in the muscles of his arms and so forth. So uh, this is hooked up with some electronics which codes this all the information coming from the uh, sensors and which also sends electronic signals to these various devices such as the TV cameras. And this is linked by radio, let's say, with a robot. Now the robot has TV camera eyes which correspond to the TV screens in this helmet that the guy is wearing. And it has microphones which hook up to the uh, earphones or loudspeakers in the helmet. And also, it has servo mechanisms which move its arms and so forth in accordance with the signals obtained from this harness that the person is wearing. So the effect of all this is that when the person is hooked up in this telerobot system, he actually has the feeling that he is in the robot. Now this has been done in Japan, uh, so I have uh, read. And the uh, illusion that is created by this device is fairly effective. Even though it's what they have today, what they can build today is a fairly crude kind of device. Because, uh, for example, uh, when you look through the TV cameras of this machine, you're looking out, I mean through the TV screens, you're looking out through the TV cameras of the telerobot. And when you turn your head, uh, the robot head turns at the same time. And so you scan across the image of the place that the robot, uh, the thing, the area the robot is looking at. So you actually have the illusion that you're the robot and that you're seeing from the perspective of the robot. Even though, for example, the human eyes obviously have the power to move in their sockets, whereas I don't think they have that for the cameras on this robot. Uh, so you can see that even a fairly crude device like that will create the illusion that, uh, well, I'm this robot. So, uh, in fact, one person reported having an out-of-body experience using this device because he was looking around from the perspective of the robot and he looked over and saw his body sitting there with the helmet on his head. And it was a very shocking experience. Uh, to look over and see his own body. Uh, so this is the telerobot. So that's ingredient number one for this uh, little story. The second ingredient is the idea of a simulated world. And people are working on this. 
uh, we, at this artificial life conference, we saw uh, some reports of the kind of thing that they're doing. But what you do in a simulated world is the following thing. You have a very powerful computer, and using computer graphics technology and so on, you create a three-dimensional model of a world with different entities in it. For example, in the case we saw, it was a model of uh, the ocean floor, let's say a few hundred yards off the shore here at Pacific Beach, where you have this kelp growing up and you have different crabs scuttling around and fish swimming through and so forth. So uh, there are powerful computers that can actually generate a very uh, vivid presentation of such a world in real time. We saw some videotape showing this kind of thing. Uh, and actually, today they have uh, flight simulator uh, computers in which, uh, in real time, you can actually fly an airplane through simulated circumstances in which there are other airplanes there moving, and you may see an aircraft carrier down below, and you have to try to land on it, and so forth. But it's all done by simulation. And the imagery is quite realistic. So what you do is, instead of having a physical tele-robot hooked up to this helmet and other devices, you hook up the person to a simulated robot in the simulated world. For example, in that little video I made, uh, you probably may recall that there was a robot there, which was done with computer graphics based on a 3D model. So you can do that. Uh, and with a very powerful computer, you can do it in real time. So what would happen there is that the person hooked up within the helmet would find himself in the simulated world. He would be walking around within the simulated world and seeing from the point of view of the robot within that world. And uh, as he moved and turned his head, uh, his viewpoint would rotate within the simulated world and so forth. So he'd be there in the simulated world. And if you can do that with one person, well, you can do it with two people or n people, some number. So let us imagine that two people meet within the simulated world. So they're walking along. It's sort of like being in the middle of Tron, the Tron world. <laughs> so uh, you're walking along in your robot body in the simulated world. Uh, and you could do interesting psychological experiments, by the way. One could recommend this as a real subject of scientific investigation. For example, a long time ago, someone did an experiment in which a person wore a special kind of glasses, which turned the image of what he was seeing upside down. So initially, this was very bewildering because, uh, you know, the person would reach for something and his arm would go exactly in the opposite direction uh, necessary to actually reach the thing. But gradually, the person adjusted. And finally, he had the experience that everything was normal. Even though the glasses were still there, he saw things as being right side up, no problem. And he could even uh, toss a ball and catch it and pour water into a glass and so forth without difficulty. But then when he took the glasses off, suddenly everything was upside down. <laughs> and he had to adjust all over again to normal vision. So that shows something about the nature of the link between con our conscious self and the world. Uh, there's something arbitrary and adjustable about that link. So what I would propose is that if you put the person into this simulated world through this arrangement that I just described, very quickly he would adjust to that world. Let's say you can imagine that his robot body in the simulated world would be somewhat different from a human body. Surely it would be. Uh, let's say, uh, instead of legs, it might have a unicycle wheel for moving around or something like that. But the person could become accustomed to it, so much so that he would think that was quite natural if you could leave him in that simulated world for a long enough time. Uh, and then, probably, when uh, you took off the helmet and so forth and he came back to this world, he might feel extremely disoriented. So. We can now imagine two thoroughly acclimated persons meeting within the simulated world. And so they're walking along a simulated path, looking at the simulated trees and so forth. And they begin to get into a philosophical discussion. 
and the uh, they begin asking one another, well, what is the, the real nature of the self? Uh, what am I, anyway? And the, the one person would give uh, a materialistic explanation. He would say, well, what you are is what you see right there. You're that uh, body. Uh, actually, we know that there are two basic principles that every intelligent person must accept. Uh, one is that everything is made up of this material stuff that we see in this world here. And with that, he would stamp his simulated leg on the simulated ground, producing a simulated sound, <laughs> and say, yeah, everything's made of this stuff. And we know how it works. It works according to laws. He could pick up one of the simulated rocks and drop it. And sure enough, it would accelerate down with, you know, according to the formula, one half AT squared, and hit with a simulated thud. So he would say, yeah, this is the real world, and, and we are these bodies. Uh, every bit of scientific evidence we have shows that this is true. And the other person would reply, well, no, I don't, I don't think that's right. Uh, I'm not this body. <laughs> actually, my real self is somewhere else. Uh, um, I have an actual body which is sitting in a room somewhere in another place, and I'm merely linked up with this body. So this isn't my real self. So the first one would reply, what nonsense. Uh, can you show me any evidence of this? Show me this other body that you say is your real body. I would like to see it. And then the person would say, well, I can't show it to you because it's in another world. Actually, this world is not real. This is just a simulated world. Uh, so I can't show you the other body. And the uh, first person would say, well, this is ridiculous. Of course, this is the real world. What is this other world you're talking about? What is it made of, and where is it? And the person uh, would have to say, well, uh, this other world that I'm talking about is the real world. It has actual reality. Whereas here, we think these forms are real that we're seeing here and so forth, but actually they're not real. This is the world of illusion. <laughs> and so uh, the upshot of the conversation, though, would be that the the materialist there would not be convinced. And in fact, the other person who had this strange idea that he his real body was somewhere else would be unable to convince this other person that that was true. Because within the simulated world, all he could point to would be things that are part of the simulation. Uh, there'd be literally nothing he could do to get out of that world and point to anything else. So uh, this is a little story to illustrate uh, the actual situation that we're in. Uh, because, in fact, we are in a simulated world in one sense. Uh, you can then uh, continue the, the metaphorical story a little bit further. You could say that according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, first of all, it's interesting, to make this simulated world you need a powerful computer and at this artificial life conference, we heard about some ways of making the computers of the future. And this guy, Toffoli from MIT, was talking about what he called programmable matter. And the idea is that in present day computers, of course, they've miniaturized things enormously. Computers used to be made of great big vacuum tubes and, and so on. Whereas now, you need a microscope really to see the circuitry on these little chips. But he was talking about an even greater degree of miniaturization in which you have what he called programmable matter. And it's organized practically on a, a molecular or atomic level uh, into many little cellular automata that are all linked together. And so on this programmable matter, you can run all kinds of simulations using simulated laws of physics. And you get a new computational physics emerging. So he was going on about that. So one could say that uh, as far as the Srimad Bhagavatam is concerned, uh, there is a kind of programmable matter, and that's called pradhan. Uh, if you read the uh, discussion of the Sankhya philosophy, say in the third canto, what you find is that the pradhan has built into it all kinds of features which are suitable for creating a simulated world. Uh, uh, inherent within Pradhan, there's the principle of false ego and the three modes of material nature 
and the uh, different senses, also the different material elements, the tan matras, the, uh, of course, the active and uh, senses and the senses of perception, and so forth. So all these different uh, elements are inherent within pradhan, but in the pradhan stage, they're not activated. They're not doing anything. And then when Mahavishnu glances over the pradhan, you could say, in a sense, he programs this programmable matter, in a sense, and sets the simulation into motion by introducing the element of time into the uh, physical picture. And in fact, you could say that the karma of the living beings who are injected into the uh, material universe or material universes corresponds to the programming. So in any case, uh, the uh, by adjusting the behavior or activity of this pradhan, uh, Mahavishnu creates universes in which there's organized uh, structure. And these are basically simulated worlds, and they are worlds of illusion, because in these worlds there are different forms, and through the sensory apparatus, the conditioned souls are linked up with these forms. So that's just like the, the body of the individual being linked up to the simulated bodies in this simulated world through the apparatus of this helmet and electronics and so forth. So it's a uh, you can draw an analogy to that. And of course, uh, another interesting feature is that the material world is called the world of names. Uh, well, in this simulated world, which is being run on a computer, everything is being done by symbol processing. Uh, there's no real substance there anywhere. Uh, it's all a matter of manipulating symbols within the computer. Uh, so uh, you can draw this in comparison between the world of names, because in this world, all you've really got, apart from the Pradhan itself, uh, is uh, systems of names and so forth. That is described. So you can draw an analogy there. And of course, this world is the world of Maya, or illusion. But the important thing about Maya is when you say that something is Maya, you don't mean that there's nothing there. Uh, what you mean is that there is something there which creates an illusion uh, of something which actually isn't there. There's are so many comparisons of uh, mistaking a uh, stick for a snake or a rope for a snake or being out in the desert and seeing what seems to be a lake shimmering in the distance. Uh, but actually, there's no lake there. There's just a, a layer of hot air refracting the, the light from the sky and giving the impression of a lake. So uh, the actual situation is that you have a uh, simulated world. And we have our real existence uh, on a transcendental level. The spirit soul actually belongs to a different world, and that's the real world, which is the spiritual reality. And uh, through this apparatus, we are linked up with these illusory bodies and so forth. So one can uh, illustrate these ideas using this uh, concept of uh, the, the simulated world. Uh, these uh, computer people like to talk about this kind of thing. The thing that gave me the idea for it was that uh, in the discussions at this artificial life conference, uh, the issue was raised as to whether a computer simulation could actually exhibit consciousness. And one person was arguing, well, if you make a simulation of a bridge using different formulae and calculations, that's not a real bridge. You can calculate stresses and strains on the bridge, and you can calculate at what point of loading of the bridge it's going to collapse and so forth. But it's not a real bridge. So this guy, Thomas Otofoli, said that, well, if you made a simulated bridge with simulated creatures in simulated cars driving across it, and then it collapsed, then within the simulation, the simulated creatures would go plummet plummeting down and smash into things in a simulated way. So that would be just as real as uh, the world we're in. <laughs> that was his argument. Well, he was partially right. Uh, the thing he missed, though, was that if all you had was the simulation, then there would be no consciousness of what was going on. There would be merely calculations 
generating some numbers, in other words, manipulation of symbols, and there would be no awareness. But the actual, uh, the only ingredient you'd have to add there was to say that you had a simulated bridge with simulated cars and simulated creatures, but you also had the link up so that actual conscious beings were linked up through sensory connections with those simulated creatures. Then they would actually identify with them and feel that they were those creatures. And then when the bridge collapsed, they would experience falling down and smashing into things and so forth. Uh, so he left out that essential ingredient. But that's the ingredient you can't see from within the simulation. Because uh, uh, as you can see from the example, in the simulation, there's no way you can see the, the actual apparatus of the simulation. So that's the situation we're in. So how do you get out of that? Well, you can see what's required to get out of the simulated world. If you were really in it, there'd be nothing you could do to get out. You could only get out of the simulated world if somebody actually unstrapped you from the apparatus, took off the helmet, and then suddenly there you were, out of the simulation. So, uh, and that would be very disconcerting for you if you were really wrapped up in that simulation. So you can imagine a way of sort of decompressing people from the simulation. What you do is you have what we call a simulated avatar. <laughs> what you would need to have would be have somebody meet you in the simulated world, in a simulated body, but if he knows what the real story is. So he would very carefully explain to you within the simulation that it is just a simulation and explain how it is working. And if you uh, properly related to this individual, asking humble questions and rendering service and so forth, <laughs> then uh, eventually you'd become qualified and he'd say, okay, uh, are you ready? Now we're going to take you out of the simulation and then take off the guy's helmet and suddenly, wait a minute, this isn't the simulation anymore. This is the real world. So that's the only way you could really get a person out of the simulation, assuming that he'd been in there for a very long period of time. Say a few billion, billion, billion years or something like that. So that's a, uh, a little story. By the way, I should point out this isn't a new story. It's been told before. Plato told this story using his own uh, way of putting it, where he told about the cave and the different beings in the cave who are just seeing shadows projected on the wall. It's actually the same idea. Uh, he didn't have such good technology in those days. Uh, they weren't burdened with it. So he just had the idea of uh, puppet-like figures projected onto a wall with a, a fire that was behind them casting shadows. But basically it was the same idea. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, text 27. The spirit soul, bewildered by the influence of false ego, thinks himself the doer of activities that are in actuality carried out by the three modes of material nature. So, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada says, two persons, one in Krishna consciousness and the other in material consciousness, working on the same level, may appear to be working on the same platform. But there is a wide gulf of difference in their respective positions. The person in material consciousness is convinced by false ego that he is the doer of everything. He does not know that the mechanism of the body is produced by material nature, which works under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. The materialistic person has no knowledge that ultimately he is under the control of Krishna. The person in false ego takes all credit for doing everything independently, and that is the symptom of his nescience. He does not know that this gross and subtle body is the creation of material nature under the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as such, his bodily and mental activities should be engaged in the service of Krishna and Krishna consciousness. The ignorant man forgets that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is known as Hrishikesha, or the master of the senses of the material body. For due to his long misuse of the senses in sense gratification, he is factually bewildered by the false ego, which makes him forget his eternal relationship with Krishna. 
So this verse and the uh, purport uh, raises a very interesting question in Western philosophy. This is called the, uh, the problem of free will. And the basic question is, are we able to act according to our will, or are we simply conditioned by material nature? Uh, so this leads to the related question of responsibility. If a person is simply acting under the influence of nature, then he could say, well, I'm not responsible for my actions. They're merely impelled by the circumstances in which I find myself. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a very interesting question. In the modern scientific perspective, there's the idea that the um, living being is simply a mechanism uh, made of matter. If that is so, then the uh, person, a human being, let's say, is merely acting according to the laws of physics. And everything that the person does is working out mechanically according to those laws. So in that case, one would tend to think that, well, the person does not have any uh, free will. This is an idea that, that arises. So uh, here in the Bhagavad Gita, we have an interesting statement that uh, would seem to indicate that the uh, living being, in one sense, does not have free will. Because Krishna is saying here that the living being thinks himself to be the doer of activities, but actually these activities are carried out by the modes of material nature. Uh, these uh, gunai, there are three gunas, uh, known as goodness, passion, and ignorance. So it is stated here that the uh, material nature, or prakriti, is carrying out activities in accordance uh, with these three modes. And a person who is bewildered by false ego is thinking that he's carrying out the activities. Nonetheless, it is also a fact that the uh, individual is held responsible for his activities in the Vedic literature. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna specifically says that he doesn't take responsibility for the activities of the individual. So if the activities are being carried out by the material nature, then how is it that the person is responsible? So the uh, answer to that question is that actually the, the Krishna as the super soul is directing the uh, action of matter. Uh, so the material energy has a superior source of direction that uh, the spirit soul or the actual conscious individual within the body does not have the power to directly uh, control the material energy. But the super soul who is accompanying the living being within the heart uh, does control the material energy. So typically the super soul is controlling the material energy in accordance with the uh, desires of the individual and also the karma of the individual. So uh, for this reason, the individual is responsible for what happens because the super soul has arranged that, all right, uh, I will make things happen according to your desire, so you have to take responsibility for what happens. Uh, and karma, in fact, is the uh, means whereby one receives um, feedback uh, for one's actions. Uh, if one performs actions in, in one way, one will get one sort of karmic reaction, and if one performs actions in a different way, there will be some different reaction. So that is a system of uh, punishment, actually, and reward uh, for those who are acting on a uh, material platform uh, as conditioned souls. So, uh, in, there's a very interesting uh, purport in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in which Srila Prabhupada points out that you can actually realize the presence of the Supersoul uh, 
as the guiding um, uh, source of intelligence within the body. He says there that even a common man can do this. And he outlines a series of steps whereby this is possible. So the first step that Srila Prabhupada points out there is that one can recognize by introspection that one is not the material body. And he says this may not be obvious immediately, but uh, actually by very careful uh, thought and discrimination, you can distinguish between yourself and the material body, including the uh, subtle processes of the mind. So basically the process there is to examine what you're perceiving and see how you're different from that. Of course, it's easy for us to understand that we're different from the uh, sort of gross limbs and so forth of the body because you know that if a person's arm is cut off or something like that, the person remains the same as a conscious uh, individual. But someone may have doubts when it comes to the action of the mind. Still, one can observe the actions of one's mind and discriminate between that and one's own self by observing how these different mental images and so on are coming and going, and they are something that we are perceiving, but the perceiver is different from those continually flickering mental images. So by carefully considering this, one can discriminate between the self, and uh, which is the actual seer, and that which is seen. So that was the first point. And then the second point that Srila Prabhupada made was that uh, once you see that your self is distinct from the material body, you can actually understand that the body is acting and reacting according to the modes of material nature. Uh, you can do this by just analyzing what the body is, is doing. And you can see it's following rules uh, of a material uh, nature. And uh, so the body is essentially acting like some sort of mechanism, something like that. But there is a further step. And that step is to realize that, in fact, even though the uh, body is acting according to some rules or laws independent of our self, that is, one can realize the purport of this verse in the Bhagavad Gita, that we are not actually the doer, uh, doers of activities, uh, still, one can see that these activities are not just coming about or being carried out in a haphazard way but there's some intelligence involved. However, that's not our intelligence. So one can come to that point of discrimination. Srila Prabhupada points out that one can see that one is taking uh, the assistance of some higher intelligence. Uh, and if a person is unable to do this, then he becomes uh, deranged or unable to uh, function in a normal fashion. So there are many simple examples in which you can see how we're taking advantage of some uh, higher intelligence which is directing the action of the body. Uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he's the source of memory, uh, intelligence, uh, also forgetfulness, and so on. And you can see that the different abilities that we have are not directly under our control, nor do we understand how they work. Uh, we depend on these basic abilities all the time, but if we're asked to explain how they work, we don't know. Uh, and even the uh, deepest studies in modern science really don't give us much information on this. Take, for example, the fact that one is speaking. Uh, when you speak, uh, you have some idea in mind that you want to express, and immediately uh, grammatical sentences come out expressing that. And actually, if you think about this, you can see that uh, even if in theory you understand how it works, which we really don't understand, uh, still uh, you're not putting the sentences together according to your own conscious uh, intelligence, selecting the words and so forth. If you tried to do that, you wouldn't even be able to speak at a normal speed. It's all just happening. 
So one could say, well, uh, this is perhaps being done by some mechanism, some computer-like machine within the brain. And in fact, someone will argue that uh, damage to the brain can interfere with this process. And so that shows that it is being carried out by a machine within the brain. But one can ask how the machinery got organized in the first place. For example, if we have a computer which carries out some complex task, there's the question of how the computer got programmed. Uh, we know that uh, in all practical cases that there's some human programmer who programmed the computer. And once that was done, then the computer could function. And of course, if the computer is damaged, then those functions are interfered with. So in the case of the brain, it may be that some mechanism is producing speech, let us say. And it may be that by damage to certain speech centers in the brain, one interferes with that. But still, how did the brain get organized in that way? Uh, that is the question. So if you carry the computer analogy to uh, its ultimate limit, one would come to the idea that perhaps there's some programmer that has uh, programmed the brain. And that programmer could not be exactly ourselves because we don't understand how the whole thing is working. So that is an indication that there is some uh, intelligence there which is distinct from our own self. Actually, this is, these are examples from just ordinary life, day-to-day uh, -day living. But in the life experience of uh, people in arts and sciences and so forth who are in involved in creative activities, there are many other examples of this. Uh, one interesting example is provided by a, a mathematician named Poincaré, who lived uh, in the early part of this century. So this Poincaré was involved in the study of many very difficult mathematical problems. And when dealing with such problems, what one finds is that it's not possible consciously to solve the problem. If a problem's of a fairly simple, straightforward nature, then you can solve it by applying some standard method. But Problems of this type uh, don't yield to such methods. You can uh, stare at the problem for hours, and uh, it's impossible to come up with any solution. So this Poincaré was a very brilliant mathematician, but there were certain problems that he would just work on for days, and he wouldn't get anywhere with them. But what would happen would be that while he was thinking about something else or performing some other activity, suddenly the solution to the problem would come into his mind. and Typically, what would come into his mind would not just be some simple thing, like one little step, but a whole elaborate set of ideas would just come into his mind all of a sudden. So then he could completely work out the solution to the problems he was working on. So uh, this was very striking to Poincaré. And he actually came up with the idea that there's something that he called the subliminal self which is providing the solutions to, the, to these problems. Uh, and he analyzed the nature of this subliminal self. He said that the subliminal self seems to have uh, very great powers of discrimination. And also, it has very great aesthetic appreciation, because typically, these solutions that he would get would be very beautiful. They'd have all kinds of symmetric features, and, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, he, and he observed that this subliminal self seemed to be able to do things that the conscious self cannot do. So finally, he asked himself, well, uh, must we conclude that this subliminal self is superior to the conscious self? It seems as though it is. So at that point, he backed away from this idea, and he said, I would hate to, to accept such a thing. Because uh, basically, he had an atheistic outlook. So he didn't like the idea that there should be such a uh, subliminal self that was more powerful than, than his own conscious self. And so he tried to explain how uh, perhaps the solutions were produced by some mechanical process of just testing out combinations at random until you, you get a solution. Actually, though, that won't work very well because there are too many combinations. 
Uh, there again, one who would like to avoid the idea of a subliminal self, superior to the conscious self, could argue that, well, perhaps there is some uh, algorithm that's being executed, some system of steps that the brain is going through that yields the solution to the problem. And for some reason, we're not conscious of those steps. Uh, so even so, though, you'd have to ask, well, how did the brain come to carry out those steps? Uh, a computer couldn't carry out steps like that unless you programmed it uh, with very great intelligence. In fact, computers of today can't solve problems of that sort, and so no one has yet been intelligent enough to come up with that kind of programming. So one would think then that uh, if the brain is doing it by carrying out some kind of program or algorithm, then uh, there must be some source to that program or algorithm. So where did it come from? So one again is confronted with the idea that there's some intelligence that is uh, operating. However, there is certainly plenty of evidence to suggest that this intelligence isn't merely setting up machinery, but it's actually acting within our lives from uh, moment to moment. Uh, there are other uh, people in different uh, creative situations, such as musicians. Uh, for example, Mozart made the observation that, um, well, he was describing how he would compose symphonies. And in his case, what would happen would be that he would be just taking a walk after dinner or something like that. And a whole symphony would start just emerging into his mind. And he said that, uh, I have nothing to do with it. I don't know where it's coming from. And his problem would be, and he would say that uh, at a certain point he could hear the whole thing simultaneously. He would observe that this music would just come into his mind and his problem would be uh, writing it down fast enough. Uh, so where does that come from? One would have to postulate in his case that, well, maybe there's a, a mechanism within the brain that generates music. And if you ask, well, where does that mechanism come from? In his case, the problem is that uh, he had a rather rare degree of talent. And one would have to say, well, maybe that just happened by chance. But do we find that by chance you can produce remarkable things like that? For example, going back to computers again, uh, if by chance you just randomly throw some numbers into the memory of a computer and try and run that as a program, will it compute, uh, compose beautiful music for you? Uh, you won't find that to be the case. So uh, these indications, even in day-to-day -day life, uh, do suggest that there's some higher intelligence which is actually there with us. Uh, so it's not that uh, God is simply uh, something remote who may have uh, created the universe and set it running and so forth. But the indication is that there's actually, uh, we're receiving from moment to moment guidance from some higher intelligence. So this is the uh, basic uh, principle described in the Bhagavad Gita and in Vedic literature, literature in general. Basically, uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, summed that up by citing the uh, English uh, phrase that uh, man proposes and God disposes. Namely, that we have desires to carry out different activities, and in accordance with our particular karma, then the super soul uh, grants those desires, or else he may not grant them, as the case may be. That depends on whether we deserve to uh, receive the particular desired result. So in this way, the conscious self is actually not the, the doer of activities, but in another sense, the conscious self is the doer because Krishna is agreeing to act according to the desire of the conscious self. And so Krishna then says, well, the given being, the given spirit soul has to take responsibility for that in the form of different karmic reactions. Of course, this is true only if the spirit soul is acting independently of Krishna. So as long as one is acting on one's own behalf, 
uh, without regard for uh, Krishna's instructions, then one receives karmic reactions for one's different activities. But if one acts in service to Krishna, then there are no karmic reactions, because then Krishna actually takes responsibility. If you're doing what Krishna wants you to do, then he will take full responsibility for all the, the results of that. So actually what we should do is act in uh, devotional service to Krishna, and then our actions will actually be perfect, because they'll be in agreement with uh, Krishna's desires. So these are some observations concerning uh, this question of free will. I thought I'd make uh, some other observations concerning uh, the, the scientific issues that come up in this connection. For example, recently we had a uh, conference in uh, San Francisco held by the Bhaktivedanta Institute. Uh, the title of the conference was uh, Consciousness Within Science. And so we were discussing there uh, the nature of consciousness from a scientific point of view. There were a number of uh, eminent scientists there. So uh, one of the talks that was given, which I thought was, I think, one of the most interesting ones presented there, uh, was by a Professor Benjamin Libet from uh, San Fr uh, University of California in San Francisco. So he has done experiments on the brain in which he tries to investigate the question of free will. And he claimed that he could show that actually the mind could not be directing the, the action of the brain according to its will. He could experimentally give evidence refuting this idea. Uh, this was in reference to some of us who were suggesting that the mind can uh, cause the brain to do things. So he argued that no, it's not like that. The brain is the actual source of initiative to action. And we may feel that we are acting according to our will, but uh, actually we are acting according to the direction of the brain. And so this feeling is to a certain extent illusory. Uh, this was his claim. So he gave uh, evidence for this along the following lines. It seems that uh, if you decide to move your arm, let's say, there is something called the action potential, which uh, takes place within the brain and lasts for a period of about half of a second uh, before the action begins. And this action potential can be measured with an electroencephalogram. So what you find is that before you move the arm, for about a half second, there is a uh, surge of electrical activity within a certain part of the brain, which builds up. And then the uh, actually this first builds up in a certain motor control region in the brain, uh, secondary motor control region, and then it spreads from there to the primary motor control regions, and then from there, nerve impulses go to the muscles and so forth, uh, moving the arm. So uh, Libet was investigating when people experience will to perform an action. And so uh, he performed an experiment in which he had a person watching a uh, rotating dot and on a, I guess, metal disc, something like that. And he gave them the instruction that at some point, whenever you desire, move your hand. Uh, but remember where the dot was at the moment that you first experienced the desire to make that movement. And he was instructing them to just move according to your own free will, whenever you want to. So what he uh, maintains is that in these experiments, he would find that the action potential would already be uh, um, in process for about 350 milliseconds before the point where the person reported the will to make the movement. And so he said, well, before the person experiences the will to make the movement, the uh, movement is already set into action by the brain. 
So this shows that this feeling of will is illusory. The person is not actually acting according to his will, because the brain was acting first. So this was his observation. And so he was saying then, well, this shows that you couldn't have the mind uh, influencing the brain and so forth. So it's an interesting observation. But from the point of view of the Vedic literature, uh, I would suggest that his observation is a little bit uh, too naive or limited, because uh, will is not such a simple thing. Uh, what we see here is it's described that uh, a bewildered soul will think that he's the doer of activities which are also actually being carried out by the modes of nature. So in one sense, according to that verse, you would expect that uh, the person's activities are being carried out by the modes of nature, that is, by the material apparatus of the body, and the person is thinking that I'm doing it, it's happening according to my will, but actually uh, the term there is uh, ahankara vimudatma, he's bewildered by false ego into thinking that. Actually, that's an illusion. Uh, he's not really doing it according to his will. So uh, that's one conclusion that can be derived there. But then that leads into the further discussion that I just went through, namely uh, that, well, if that's true, then uh, how could we be held responsible for our actions? And uh, are we simply passive entities sort of being carried along by nature? Uh, in that case, what's the use of trying anything uh, if we have no actual independence? And of course, the answer is that actually we do have independence and we can make our own choices. But uh, according to our desire, these choices and activities are carried out by the super soul who's directing the actions and reactions of the elements within the body. So it's actually a very complex process. Uh, in this particular case of the experiment with the brain, it may well be that the person does not actually have any independent will regarding moving his hand in this experiment. Uh, it might be that instead of that, you could say his will is actually uh, to uh, cooperate with the experimenter. And having willed to do that, then a whole complex set of actions is set into motion in which he moves his, his arm and so forth, and feels that uh, this is happening according to his will. So will is actually a complicated uh, issue. In fact, according to the Vedic literature, uh, the most important thing is actually to have the, uh, the correct desire or the correct will. Uh, for example, in the chanting of the holy name of Krishna, it's described that there are different offenses involved in uh, chanting of the holy name. These mainly are related to attitudes or ideas one has about the, uh, the holy name. So if you are infested with these particular offensive ideas or attitudes, then the chanting of the holy name will not be immediately effective. So then one could say, well, why not just give up those attitudes? Because if you do, then it will be effective. So, uh, in fact, it's described that even when you come to the, the end of the offensive uh, stage of chanting and you haven't yet uh, reached the stage of love of God in this so-called Nama Bas stage, uh, all the different um, anarthas of material life are, are driven away by that. And uh, so you could say, well, then why not uh, avoid these offenses? But uh, it turns out that it's not easy to do that because we're bewildered about what our real motives uh, are. So that's a whole uh, subject to go into. So let's see. It's about quarter of. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Yeah? In this case, I would uh, try to think about uh, how to exercise our own will in a material uh, setting. Uh, but consider the more important problem of uh, aligning our own will with the divine will of God. 
uh, how, how do we begin to go about doing something like that? Well, to do that, uh, ultimately it's a, a gradual process of uh, purification because one has to start by being basically willing to uh, follow uh, Krishna's instructions and so forth. But initially, one is bewildered about one's own motives, as I was just mentioning. So the chanting of the holy name cleanses the, the heart. And so initially, one will be bewildered about one's own motives, and so one will not actually have pure desires with relation to Krishna consciousness, even though you may have heard instructions as to what pure desires might be. Uh, it's hard to realize this within oneself initially. But because the chanting uh, purifies the heart, then gradually one, when, one will realize uh, to a more and more perfected degree uh, what one's desires are and what they should be. And thus one will be able to come to a point of having pure desires in relation to devotional service. So uh, that uh, ties in with the whole question of uh, then of, of free will and, and so forth. It's a matter of realizing what we're actually uh, willing. But if we undertake this process, then uh, the purifying effect of the holy name will enable us to do that gradually.